Many people know Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. as the leader of the civil rights movement, but very few know how significant of a role he played in the 1960 presidential election between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. That's the premise of a new book called Nine Days, The Race to Save Martin Luther King Jr.'s Life and Win the 1960 Election. Stephen and Paul Kendrick co-authored the book. It's now available online and in stores. Thank you both for joining me. It's great to have you with us. Paul, let me start with you. This book really focuses in on how both political candidates, Kennedy and Nixon, towed the line when it came to civil rights, and it wasn't entirely clear who Dr. King would even back at the beginning. So why couldn't these two candidates make a clear stance? Well, both candidates were very focused on white voters uh, and did not really want to talk about race and civil rights in the campaign. And two things changed that that you learn about in this book. One is the Atlanta student movement, black college students who were doing sit-ins and convinced their friend, Dr. King, to do a sit-in and go to jail with them because they wanted to force politicians to talk about civil rights. And then on the Kennedy campaign, there is a team of civil rights advisors, an interracial trio named uh, Louis Martin, Harris Wofford, and Sergeant Shriver, and they get their campaign involved in intervening for King and eventually involving their candidate in that, sending out two million unsanctioned pamphlets on what they did through Black America without white voters focusing in on it. And so it really took people willing to speak up against this injustice uh, to force the issue out into the open of civil rights. And then Kennedy ultimately uh, would do some politically courageous things that would shift the Black vote in America. So interesting. Stephen, do you see any similarities between the 1960 election and the 2020 election? Uh, both were historical in the number of people who voted. Um, do you see any similarities between those two? Uh, there are vast similarities. First of all, razor close. And the role of race was so crucial. Uh, we all saw and waited up very late at night for the votes to come in from DeKalb County. When King was first arrested with the students, um, it was quite controversial and dangerous at that time for any civil rights activist to willingly go to jail. This would be the first time that Martin Luther King would go to jail. And the students had a cry. They said, jail, no bail. So when King went in, uh, he basically was putting his life on the line. His family was deeply concerned about his life. And so those uh, Kennedy civil rights staffers, they kind of had to go rogue uh, to, to work for King's life and his release. And, um, and DeKalb County, which was then seen as Klan County in terms of uh, civil rights activists from Atlanta, in this election in 2020, it ended up helping to carry uh, Georgia for Biden and to now elect two new senators. So it's amazing how events have, have come true 61 years later. And Paul, that phone call that John Kennedy made to Coretta Scott King regarding her husband being in prison seemed genuine. Um, but do you think that that was the clincher? Is, is that what really turned the tide in favor of Kennedy? Would he have won over so many black voters without that call? It's a great question. Well, one thing that one of our heroes in the story, Louis Martin, who was this uh, black staffer from Chicago working on Kennedy's campaign, you know, the, the call happened, but he felt that black voters hadn't really focused in on it yet. So it was him doing what's called the blue bomb, which was getting these pamphlets distributed through black churches and, and black communities without white voters ever really focusing in on that, um, that really pushed that story into showing for voters a, a sign that Kennedy maybe had the character uh, to push civil rights more and to take on inequalities uh, in the White House. And so that call 
um, and Bobby, and it's an interesting story of how it all happened, but Bobby calling the racist judge in DeKalb County uh, were all part of it. But, uh, but Martin, Wofford, and Triver were also running a substantive civil rights focused outreach campaign that was really new uh, in presidential campaigns. So they believed black voters mattered and black voters mm -hmm. narrowly were the difference narrowly electing Kennedy uh, so they could really hold him to account on uh, eventually pushing civil rights legislation. And Stephen, it's interesting because at the end of the Thursday, October 20th chapter, you do give the background of then candidate Richard Nixon. You know, we have such a clear image of him because, you know, post Watergate, I think his legacy changed dramatically. Um, but you paint a picture of him being a racial moderate and someone who was actually sympathetic uh, to some degree to the civil rights movement, stating that he openly condemned segregation while he was in law school at Duke. Then in 1960, he said in Ebony magazine, quote, I am convinced that the future of the Republican Party today lies in pressing forward on civil rights in any one of the big six states, New York, California, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Illinois, Ohio, our civil rights stand can make all the difference in the world. He was even called Mr. Civil Rights during the Eisenhower administration. Um, but then it seems after losing the election, he appeared to completely abandon these views and cater more to the, quote, Southern strategy. Um, what do you believe caused Nixon to make that massive shift? I think it was political expediency. Uh, before the 1960 election, uh, Nixon had put a lot of effort into befriending King. In fact, the day before King's arrest in Atlanta, uh, three weeks before the election, Daddy King endorsed Nixon. So the black vote was up for grabs. And that's hard for us to believe now, because this book helps describe the creation of the political world that we know, where black voters really do uh, veer towards the Democratic Party, and where the Republican Party has really double down on this creation that, that Nixon discovered in the 1960 election of, of creating the Southern strategy, of appealing to white Southern voters. And uh, he did that, uh, really, by abandoning his friend, um, King. Uh, Nixon did nothing. Nixon had black advisors, but he ignored them. And his silence really did help create the political world that we know today. And, Paul, you know, the book goes into a lot of behind-the-scenes activity uh, with Martin Luther King Jr., John Kennedy, Richard Nixon. Why did you take this route uh, in writing the book? Well, people maybe know there was a call from Kennedy to Coretta. There was a call from Bobby the Judge. But what we found was this is such a richer story uh, when the Atlanta student movement activists are, are centered in it, when you understand King's courage and why it was an agonizing decision for him to go to jail. Uh, but in facing down death and that experience, would allow him to make the kind of national change that he was searching to find a path to do so. Um, but in King's family, King's lawyer, Donald Hollowell, they're all a part of the race to save Martin Luther King's life. Um, and also those GOP advisors that were pushing Nixon, which were Jackie Robinson and a man named E. Frederick Morrow, and then uh, this team. And we really loved the, the bond of this team. We felt they model for us an effective interracial uh, group that uh, worked together, Louis Martin, Wofford, and Shriver, uh, how Wofford and Shriver really listened to Morrow, let him guide them. And uh, so all together, it, it gives you an American panorama of these dramatic, uh, exciting uh, days that are, but were so perilous for King and that I think will give anyone who reads it a deeper appreciation of his heroism um, and how he became the King that we are remembering on this day. On this very important day, Stephen Paul mentioned uh, Louis Martin there, and you refer to him as the godfather of black politicians. Can you explain why? One of the pleasures of writing this book was to really find Louis Martin and to give him his proper historical due. Now, in some ways, he worked behind the scenes. He was called the President Whisper. He was an advisor both to Kennedy 
especially close to Johnson, and even Jimmy Carter brought him into his White House. But Louis Martin uh, has been, I think, almost unforgivably forgotten in this story. And uh, he, he was a, a, a good friend to Harris Wofford and to Sergeant Driver, but they understood that they could not do this civil rights work without the savvy, the sophistication, the contacts, the, all the things that Louis Martin brought in great measure. And Louis Martin really is the key to helping to find within the Kennedy uh, campaign the moral courage uh, to do what they didn't understand was going to rebound to their favor. Uh, in the end, Kennedy made this call to Coretta, and Bobby made the call to the judge, not really knowing how in three weeks that would play out electorally. It ended up, in effect, by shifting about 7 percent of the black vote. And you can make a case that this is what won Kennedy this narrow victory. But they didn't know that at the time. It took real courage. And I, one of the things upon I were most concerned about in writing this book by highlighting people like Martin, is the sense of decency and moral courage that we don't often associate with politics. And on this Martin Luther King Day, it's really important to remember that this, too, is part of our heritage. And this, too, are, are virtues that we can tap into. Um, you asked earlier about that election and this election. And um, decency and character matters. And that's really ultimately what this book is about, that kind of moral courage. We could all use a lot more of that. Stephen and Paul Kendrick, thank you so much for joining us, and congratulations on your book. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for having us.